my name is Simi J. Patoka. My pronouns are they, them. And my name is Hannah Crawford, and my pronouns are she, her. And we are... The Dreaming Divas. We are a podcast inspired by the Screaming Divas. And our goal is to create a similar platform, but from the perspective of a younger singer. Today, we had the pleasure of chatting with Leslie Fagan, um, my personal former voice teacher, who's also the voice coordinator at Wilfrid Laurier University and soprano who has performed all across the world. We had some really, really great conversations about the image of an opera singer, a little bit about meditation and work-life balance. Before we get into the podcast, we would like to graciously acknowledge that together we reside, learn, and create on the land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabewaki, Mississauga, Wendaki, Neon, Winsio, and neutral people. We seek re-indigenization. We stand with the Indigenous community and welcome Indigenous voices on this platform. We're grateful to be working and learning on and about this land, and we honor these communities as tr traditional stewards of these lands. We hope you enjoy the podcast. It was a really good one, and check it out. Ding! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me here today. Today, we thank the Indigenous people for sharing this land, Turtle Island, with us. It is a symbolic small step in seeing First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people as our stewards. Today we gather virtually from many corners of Turtle Island on my where I am, which is the Haldeman Tract, territory of the neutral Anishinaabe Haudenosaunee peoples. This land is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, which symbolizes our agreement to share, protect our resources, and not to engage in conflict. The seven grandfather teachings of the Anishinaabe, love, respect, wisdom, bravery, truth, honesty, and humility are tools for understanding and reconciliation. Our collective past provides the groundwork to walk together and honor the four directions, lands, water, plants, animals, and ancestors that walked before us. May we speak, teach, learn, live, laugh, and make music with gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast, Leslie. It's so nice to meet you. Nice to see you guys too. Nice to meet you. I put red lipstick on for this. Ooh. <laughs> you know it's serious when that happens, right? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All right. So, Leslie, we um, we like to begin every uh, interview with a 60 second life story. Feel free to add in all the good bits and I will hold okay. the timer up right here for you okay. to keep track. Okay. <laughs> <Miss Jess. laughs> Whenever you're ready. You mean really go? Oh, okay. Okay, uh, go. I was born in Ottawa, Ontario to two musical parents, Marlene and Gerald Fagan, who raised me in a musical household with uh, four siblings, Louise, Judy, Jennifer, John, oh, for a moment there, I thought I couldn't remember the names. And um, we lived in, I was born in Ottawa, then we moved to London, Ontario, and then we moved to Listowel, Ontario, um, lived there until I was about 16. And then um, we moved back to London, Ontario, where my parents ran London Fanshawe Symphonic Chorus, Gerald Fagan Singers, and the Symphony Orchestra there. I left London and went to University of Toronto for music, Yep. And uh, then after University of Toronto and during that time I went and studied in England and I studied in France and I sang for the first time with orchestra when I was 19 years old and I've got uh, seven seconds left and I have a daughter named Isabella and I now live in Baden and I teach singing at Wilfrid Laurier University where I coordinate the voice program and I'm an assistant professor. <laughs> Perfect. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. That was really great. Awesome. Um, so Leslie, uh, you were born to musical parents. What uh, made you kind of continue in that path? Well, to be perfectly honest, I was 16 and thought, no way. <laughs> because, because, you know, I grew up in a, in a household where they were both involved in music all the time. And I think every teenager wants to have their own identity, right? And so I decided I wanted to be an archaeologist because I loved the discovery and I loved ancient Egypt and I, I loved digging in the mud. So, you know, all those things seem to be heading in the right direction. And honestly, I, I mean, I was taking singing lessons and I'd had piano lessons and all the things that you 
do in a musical household and um, thought, what would life be like if I wasn't able to sing? Uh, and I realized that it was deep, much more passionate for me than it was to be digging in the mud and using, you know, being on archaeological digs in the deep sun in the Egyptian desert with only porta potties. That was just like <laughs> the realities of it became a no for me. The so and the love of singing became a yes. Wow. Well. That's what happened. That that was like a turning point for me. Yeah. I don't think I don't think I actually knew that, but it's <laughs> kind of interesting. Did your parents want you to go in music though? Was no, your dad no. into that? No, they were pretty supportive of whatever I wanted to do. Um, funnily and, and and but you know, by the time I was uh 18, I was going to Toronto. We were living in London, and I was going to Toronto on the train with my mother, who played for all of my lessons. My mother's an astounding pianist. And so she played for my lessons and I was going and studying in Toronto with Catherine Robin and um, with Greta Kraus, the great German leader teacher. And so I would have lessons with them every week and it just became, yeah, this is what you're doing. It was just, it was a life, it became a life and a lifestyle that was um, integral in my being. Rather not, rather not something that was put upon me, it was something that I definitely was who I am. So funny that you wanted to be an archaeologist because the first thing I ever wanted to be was a geologist. And now we're both here. Is this a joke? I love rocks. Don't you love rocks? I love rocks. They're so cool. <laughs> I collect rocks. <laughs> rocks like, rock. I know they do. I have like a cupboard with little drawers of rocks that I've collected from all over the world. And sand. <laughs> oh, yes. I know a few people that do the sand thing for sure. Yeah, and I have it in jars. Yeah. That's yeah, so that's funny. Um, so your your father was a conductor, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. Did was. did uh and did uh he kind of teach you how to work with an orchestra, work with a conductor when it came to your future and what you were you were leading towards? Um, I don't think formally, no. But um, when I was sixteen, I was singing in the Gerald Fagan Singers, and that's a semi-professional choir. They're, they're no longer in existence, but, um, and you know, there was, he was always standing in front waving his arms. And so I would know when to come in and I was in Ontario youth choir and I watched a conductor. So choral experience growing up, you know, church choir with my mom conducting one hand on the organ, one hand in the head going like this, you know, so choral music and having a conductor in front of me was always, um, there was present so I, I think it sort of wove its way in but when I went to an orchestra rehearsal for the first time I had to learn a few things and so mm -hmm. I was pretty grateful and I still am these days for conductors that have um, a talk through first and they often do it with piano before you stand in front of the orchestra yeah and when you get it especially if it's somebody that you don't know and you're working with them for the first time you get to get their mannerisms you how their body works, how their head works, you sort of begin to understand and you, you quickly assimilate. And so I, I'm, I'm grateful for that, um, that integral part of my upbringing. And then the first time I sang with orchestra, my father conducted. So that was a little bit of an easier thing. Yeah, you already had been seeing him work. Yeah. So you yeah, it wasn't completely foreign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, and aside from kind of a kind of getting a sense of their mannerisms and how they conduct, what else did you learn uh, working with um, orchestra for for the first orchestra rehearsal, for example? Um, I learned that when different sounds come from different parts of the orchestra, you have to be aware of that as a singer because because let's say we're talking about a pitch like let's just say A, and when the violins play an A versus when um, the oboe plays an A, that's a different sound. And yeah. that's a slightly different pitch, even like the overtones change. And so if they're doubling you as the singer, your sense of that pitch should change based on what the orchestra is doing. And orchestra members in my, in my experience so far in this little career that I've had, they love the fact that you're aware of them. Like, because, mm -hmm. because then it becomes a partnership, right? It's a, I learned that I'm depending on them. It's not me and the orchestra. It's not the soloist and the band. It's always you're one of them. 
always. Right. And it works so much better. Cool. That's awesome. I also learned that um, at rehearsals, if the conductor is okay with it, that during the first time we sing together, I sing into the orchestra facing them. Oh, interesting. Because it does a couple of things. It allows them to hear my sound. It allows me to watch how they play, to watch what they do, how their mannerisms are, so that when I turn around, I'm hearing and I'm also visually seeing what I saw. And there's so there's a there's a multi-layered understanding of what's happening in the orchestra. I'm yeah, it's not like Muzak's on and we're singing along. No way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, I always wondered, like, the couple of times I've been able to work with an orchestra has been, like, how do these singers or uh, orchestra members, how do they watch the conductor, listen to a singer, and then also play at the same time? It kind of breaks my brain a little bit, because I'm like, who do you actually listen to? The singer? Do, the no, con- I, well, I know the conductor. Like, who? <laughs> the conductor's a good conductor, and, they, like, some conductors just get it. And then some orchestra, like they can, and they pull everybody together. Um, And then some orchestra members are really great, especially um, I find the first chair violinist and the cellist are always like, they're watch the body language of the singer. Cause you often you're standing, if you're standing with the orchestra in an oratorio on stage, they Mm -hmm. see, of -hmm. course, an opera is different. You're heavily dependent on the person standing in front of you. Right. Of course. Yeah. That's actually a great segue. A question that we were having was how, how, what is the difference between preparing for an opera versus preparing for an oratorio? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I personally don't prepare any differently. So, um, with, when you go to an oratorio, generally, you don't have as much rehearsal time as you do when you do an opera. Right. So you don't know everybody else's parts um, in, in, you don't have the, just rewind that. You don't have the opportunity to act with everybody else's parts in an oratorio the way that you do in an opera because you don't have that time. Having said that, we aren't generally, we don't have props, we don't have scenery when you're doing oratorio. But my preparation is no different. I'm a character. I have to know who that person is. I have to know what their intention is when they're singing. Obviously, language, understanding, all the things you do when you sing leader or anything else that you do. But then when you come to oratorio, you have to realize that you're not dependent upon a costume and you're not dependent upon scenery. And so there is a drama there. And the drama is no different than an operatic drama. I mean, you think about solomon and there's this one point when solomon says you two have to split the child i mean that's a real thing you each have to take half of this child if you both claim this child is yours and so in opera that would be drama right but it but on an oratorio stage you have the responsibility to convey that drama in the same way but without the props or without so there's no difference for me translation nothing it is uh, and i know the other person's parts especially if we're talking back and forth right absolutely yeah you your um the the repertoire that you have uh, accomplished in your career is vast but there is there is a significant amount of oratorio what draws you to oratorio so much um well early on when i started singing that's what i got hired for and I got hired for um, opera sometimes, but not as much. I had a smaller voice when I began. And uh, I suppose I grew up in a household where oratorio was, I mean, my dad conducted oratorios, right? And so that was a natural segue. Um, certainly I love doing opera. It just was not part of what, how I was hired and what happened. But um, I also stayed at the first part of my career, I stayed in Canada a lot. And there's, there were a lot more oratorio opportunities then then there were um, opera opportunities at that time. So um, having said that, I adore Handel. Like, I just, yeah. And Bach, love it. And, you would assume you're going to get along great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, like, <laughs> but don't get me wrong. If I get the chance to sing the Verdi Requiem, oh, I'm a happy camper. So it, <laughs> it's like, it's like a smorgasbord, you know? Like, where were you? 
what are you going to have next kind of thing. <laughs> That's true. It is very versatile too, I think, especially, um, you know, going into being taken a year off school and exploring any repertoire you want now, right? Because yes. you don't have to fit into like the repertoire requirements anymore, obviously. Right. And so it's like, oh, I can actually sing this. Yes, totally. <laughs> you can, right? It's the discovery process. The discovery process is one part of it, but I think that there's another part of it. And the other part of it is, is it time for you to sing it? Yeah. I yeah. think that the discovery process should be open door. It's like, nothing should be censored as to what you discover and maybe sing and you might not be the person to perform it right now you might never be the person to perform it i don't know that they're really ever going to hire me for wagner but that's okay yeah I'll still do it. why not yeah i can learn the music i can love the tunes i can feel the language like all of those things mm -hmm. that's the passionate part of it right yeah, and yeah. then what you get to share with your gift your um, life experience that you bring to the music, that's when you decide if this is right for you. And that's, vocally, does it fit you vocally? Yeah, that's exactly how I feel about Carmen. I'll enjoy it in my room. <laughs> it will never hit the stage. But right. uh, I'm a soprano. Like, like a soprano. I'm a Nessun Dorma diehard. Yeah, oh. <laughs> like Leslie, you can sing that, I think. I, yeah, I can sing it, but I don't. Oh, and she I, has. Don't get me wrong. She has. I have sung it, but not for anybody to hear, because because I always like, you know, when some when it oh, when a tenor sings Ness and Dorma, even if they sing it horribly, I cry every time. Leslie, didn't you sing it at the end of a master class at the end of a year end master class for us though a couple of weeks ago? Oh, did I? I'm pretty sure you did. <laughs> oh, well, here I just lied. <laughs> I have no recollection of that. <laughs> You mentioned in your 60 second life story about Isabella yes. and um, it's interesting because I know you had kids a little later and, and yes. while you were having a career. Yes. And so how is the work life balance for you? You know, uh -huh. you, you have a teenager now and you also have a full time career in teaching and performing. Yeah. How's that like for you? Um, well, I have these lines on my face for a reason, right? <laughs> like, like, and, and I, cause I've earned them. Mm -hmm. um it's it, it about i think the word balance is really the thing and it's never in balance it's always a, it's always a changing balance right because sometimes some things demand more than others um you know isabella is is going off to university next year and that's a crazy thing because i'm so used to balancing her in the mix of everything the wonderful thing about um the wonderful thing about having a child and having a career is that when they're little, they're portable. So yes. she came everywhere with me um, and got life experiences, you know, got held on stages by conductors, like just like amazing experiences that, that, that kids wouldn't get and an education that way as well. Mm. I had to depend heavily. The beginning of my career, I was a single mom. So I had a marriage that broke up. And so I was a single mom traveling around with a, a little girl. And so I depended pretty heavily on friends to help me in different places, especially, you know, when I was traveling abroad and stuff. So um, now she's pretty self-sufficient. And so, you know, we were in New York over Christmas and she came along with, and she had a list of places she wanted to go. and. My partner took her and they went off they went and they you know so now it's it's fun it's like yeah. it's, it's not as much work mm -hmm. um but that doesn't change the needs so it's about it's about who needs what when and like that's the balancing act right mm -hmm. um yeah you have to have support you it's really hard to do it on your own i remember talking to maureen forrester about it because she had was living in europe and she had um little kids then she had three little kids then and you're up trying to do it and she hired somebody who came into the house and helped her all the time and she always had to have help so I think that's I think we do you can't you can't be single in it and uh, but you do have to have help yeah absolutely um, you did just mention your partner and I wanted to bring up um, I, if I'm not mistaken there was a concert series uh, with your partner who is a poet can you talk a little bit about that Sure. And it was fantastic. 
gosh, it thinks. Um, my partner is Jeff Pinkney, and he's a, an author, children's author and poet. Um, he's got a couple of books published through um, uh, Orca Publishing for our children. And then he has poetry that he's written over the years, some of it for me, um, that is published uh, through One-Eyed Deer Press. Um, so we did a concert where Jeff read the poetry, some of the poetry that he'd written for me, and I responded in song. And so it was a dialogue back and forth. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was flirtatious and sometimes intimate and sometimes cheeky and sometimes, are you kidding me? And mm -hmm. all the sort of gamut of emotions that a couple bounces back and forth. It was about the courtship. And um, I think the first kiss was involved. And yeah, so it was, it was just a dialogue about, about the dance of how we got there. Right. That's wicked. What it was a cool fun. Thing. Yeah. Very cool. We've done it a number of times, actually, three, three or four times now. Mm -hmm. I remember when you, um, we watched it at, at Laurier, you performed it for us, I think a couple years ago in, yes. in the second year or something. Or COVID. Yes, of B course. <laughs> BC. Yeah, <laughs> BC, BCC before COVID. <laughs> um, and I remember watching it and it was funny because all my friends outside of our studio was kind of the first time hearing you sing too. Oh, okay. Like in, like in full, like in a full concert with just yourself. Yeah. And I remember people being floored. They're like, well, like they're performing this, like this is their whole relationship. What? <laughs> yeah. People were quite shocked. Well, I think like, it's like, it, it's like, you know, I, I, we joked at the beginning that I put my red lipstick on for this yeah. and, and the red lipstick, you know, in a way represents a shield or represents, oh, we're performing. Mm -hmm. But once the red lipstick is on, then the shield has to come down and you need to be vulnerable in order to invite people into your world. Mm -hmm. What your intention is or, or where you're coming from to invite them, they might not know. Like if you're singing a German leader song and you're referring to something personally that you felt, they might not know what it is, but they'll know they're feeling something, right? Even if they're German speakers, they might not know your personal experience that's giving you the um, the gasoline to get forward with this, right? That the intention. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to um, talking about our relationship, um, we just decided that, you know, we're having the love affair of a lifetime. So why shouldn't, why shouldn't we share that fun that we had back and forth? Mm -hmm. And his poetry is out there and people can read it. And some of it's exceedingly intimate mm -hmm. and um, I'm not there responding. So <laughs> um, this gave me a chance to sort of give my back. I mean, that's kind of joking, but suffice to say, yes, it was vulnerable. Yeah. But that's how we need to walk when we sing. Agreed. Otherwise, we're just singing along. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest life lessons I learned working with you too, to actually be vulnerable in singing. It's not, you're not putting on a facade of this image of a character. You, you are a character and it's you're telling you. their story. Yeah. Yeah. It's you telling the story the way you see it, right? Mm -hmm. Incorporate it, it together with what the composer has put on the page. Mm -hmm. So you and your feelings and your experiences become the servant to what the composer put on the page and together then it becomes you and your magic and nobody else can duplicate that. Mm -hmm. And that's the totally great human side of singing right there. Yep, and agreed. Right, totally that's, true. that's what we go for. I think what's really interesting too is um, when I when I apply that thought process into my own life, the best performances and the and the times that I have felt the most successful based on my definition of success is when I am the most me while yeah. performing. Yes, we have a saying. Um, I, I don't know how often I say it, but when we listen to people sing, especially in a university setting where you're getting marked and you're getting um, judged for lack of a better term, yeah. um, we're not are at auditions. It's the same thing on auditions as it is in examinations. At least when I'm sitting there, um, 
I'm not waiting to be techniqued by you. I'm waiting to be moved. And that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. I'm open to the possibility of being moved by you. And that's ever so evident. Um, I'm, I have often been a judge in New York City at Carnegie Hall at the Oratorio Society of New York's um, oratorio competition. It's a sizable prize and people from all over the world come to sing for that. Um, I, uh, there are so many times when people are up there and they're, they think they're working so hard and they've got beautiful voices and they've done the intellectual work. You can tell they're knowledgeable, they're smart, they're up there and there's something missing. And it's because they're worried that they're not doing it the way that we think, they think we want to know, we want to hear. No, I want somebody to sing me Bach or Handel or Verdi in a different way mm -hmm. that is them. So that I go, whoa, <laughs> that was really cool. There's a counter tenor who's quite the, quite the news these days. His name is Josef, um, I think it's Josef Orlinsky. Oh, you know? I know who you're talking of. Well, yeah. Josef, Josef was, was the winner the year I, last time I adjudicated. Oh, cool. Two times ago when I adjudicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he came out and the first thing he sang was very lovely, very beautiful. And he was stiff. And I just wrote on his paper that he, like I wrote in my notes, he needs to move. I didn't know he was a break dancer. And so then when the Bach came, he started to move. And all of a sudden it was a, it was a different singer. Yeah. So, cause he let his body go. He kind of got, and it's those things when we are when we're seeing you you know he didn't do any big break dance moves in the middle of the competition but um but he uh, he released the tension in his body and all of a sudden the sound and the voice and the joy it just came it was amazing so that whatever that is i think you have some really interesting philosophies about the image of a singer yeah. and how your body is your instrument and that it doesn't have to look a certain way Right. but it needs to perform the task in at hand that's correct and you know what I mean so I just would love to chat like pick your brain more about the image of a singer and how how you view that is beneficial to your singing technique um well unless we've all got like millions of dollars and we don't like the way that our left elbow is or we want to have liposuction on one half of our body or we want to gain weight for whatever like this is our gift how we're born and what we've got what our structure is is our gift it's our voice it's part of who we are as a human being um so um i think that you have what you have and with that you try to optimize what you've got to support the journey that you're on so what does that mean that means that you exercise in a way that works for you that makes you feel like you've got control of your body that you eat foods that nurture you and feed you that don't hinder you the question is does this help you or does this hurt you right mm -hmm. that's the that's the big question and um what do you Look, I don't, you, not the three of us on this screen, not, well, no, we don't have the same voice at all. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have the same physical structure, right? And so, whereas like my voice might have a different sound than let's say Hannah, Simi, I don't know your voice. So I just can use Hannah as, a, as an example. Hannah has this gorgeous, round, beautiful sound, right? And it's a bigger sound. I can make a sound that is can be heard in the same way as Hannah's yep. after years of knowing how to sing above an orchestra, mm -hmm. but I don't have the same roundness in my sound and colors as Hannah does. Right. And I, we could probably, I could say exactly the same thing for you, Simi. So, so our structure, how we are is what we have to deal with and what we have to work with. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter to me what somebody weighs. It does not matter to me what somebody looks like. What matters to me is somebody is healthy, is somebody is doing everything they can to support 
the track that they want to go on as a singer, right? Like mm -hmm. any one of us can put on makeup and change the way we look and we'll look in the mirror and we'll go, oh, I don't like that. Well, everybody does that, right? So sleep with tape here or what? Well, I don't know, I'm doing <laughs> stupid. But do you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, yeah. put all the cream on if you feel that's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But really, I, I can't say it enough how much I value how different we all are in our complete structures as human beings. Mm -hmm. How we think, how we put it together, who we love, how, what size we are, how, where our waists are, how our feet feel like I'm just being obtuse, but any one of those things is part of you and your gift as a performer. Right. It's, it's, it's interesting. The coming to university for me was very much like, oh, I need to stop being a college kid. And, you know, I want this career now. Maybe I should take care of my body, aka just being healthy. And like, I'm a bigger person and I really don't care about that. But it's more feeding my body what it needed to feel like I could sing and support myself was That's the right. biggest thing. That's right. Because if I eat junk all day or I don't eat enough, like a lot of the time I wouldn't eat till like 5 p.m. I don't have enough sustenance in my body to support my voice. Well, your brain should just... work. Exactly. So it's interesting just in general, just like kind of listening to your body and what it needs was the biggest thing. Huge. It's like, it's a, it's a, it's everything. And it changes, right? Like as you as you start to understand your body and the signals that we're giving that we sort of go, oh yeah, yeah, that's not gonna matter. That's not gonna matter. Mm -hmm. Then then all of a sudden things start to add up like, why am I always getting those headaches? Or why is, you know, why is that always hurting? Or how come when I eat this, this happens? So it's just about being mindful of the fuel or food as medicine or food as fuel, however you look at it, that that's going to help me in my singing in my energy, in my brain thinking, and all of that sort of stuff, because you, you're not, you can't trade it in. Um, you know, if you don't like the oboe, you can go get another one. <laughs> we can't do that. <laughs> do that with this. This is, this is us. You know, that great, that, that great show on TV, This Is Us. I think that's what it's called. Um, anyway, yeah, this is, this is who we are. Now, there's a problem with that for in some aspects of society, and that is that some we are very visual right and so there are folks that think that people should look one way and people should look this way and you have to wear this to be this and you have to wear this to be that so um i think there's a balancing act in all of this in that and i'm and i know that i'm probably treading into uh, um, an uncomfortable area for some people but because we are a visual society and because people do care sometimes about red lipstick that um, we, no matter what we believe we should look like in everyday life, when we're coming to a job and we're going to be hired, we want to put, we want to package our magnificence in the most beautiful and inviting way that we can so it doesn't distract from all the hard work that you've done when you're coming to sing. And that's a hard balancing line these days because those are ever shifting sands. Um, I had a co conversation with a colleague about that and about how, how, how that colleague went to Europe, um, a male colleague went to, was in Europe singing and went to rehearsal in a jacket and an uh, open shirt, but a nice shirt and a nice pair of pants and polished shoes. And everybody said, where are you, where are you going? Why are you so dressed up? Everybody else showed up in jeans. Right. And I can tell you another story where I have a colleague of mine that I went to rehearsal at Carnegie Hall, where that person showed up as a soloist in um, a see-through, long gypsy kind of skirt, and Birkenstocks with black toenails that were half grown out, and her hair was pretty mussy, and no bra, and uh, like, you know, summer bohemian clothes. It looked awesome never got hired again also didn't quite know her music so you know like I hate to say it it's just the reality mm -hmm. 
it's not right it's the reality you actually worded it in a really interesting way you said um packaging ourselves yeah. and how i actually kind of uh associate it with is when we're packing a gift there's a the gift there's the us and then we're putting a nice wrapping over top so that when they reveal the us inside it's like oh this is fun and exciting that's kind of how i would attribute it to on stage and like uh like you were saying i don't think that that is necessarily right or right. wrong right i have my opinions others have theirs right um but uh but there is like you were saying there is this visual aspect that uh, we want to present ourselves in a way that they think will reflect what's what's beneath the packaging. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for some people, I mean, the reality is generally when you're going to auditions or you're for anything, you're being hired or accepted by somebody who is usually a generation older than you. Yeah. Or two generations older than you. And their aesthetic is different. Mm -hmm. Their aesthetic is different. And whether we like it or not, we value people by how they present themselves. The society does. We, how much do you value a Kardashian? You know, like, like it, it's, it, it's not right because that's not how I personally value people, but that is how some people value people. They make judgments. You look at somebody, you make a judgment and that's not, that's not correct, but Packaging your package in a way that is respectful of your gift and respectful of the music you're going to present, respectful of the amount of work that you've done, and respectful of the situation that you're in, never harms. Yeah, I remember um, Liz Parker came to Opera Laurier and did a class with us last year. Yes. And um, their whole prophecy is, you know, wearing clothes that complement your body yes. for specifically for like more headshot purposes in that, in that aspect. Mm -hmm. But it was really interesting to me because there's this sense of like, you also need to read the room you're entering to for whether it's an audition or a performance or, or whatever you, you need to read the room. So you know how to react accordingly. And so like, for like, for instance, here um, on the podcast, it's, you know, it's casual in a sense, but some days I like to dress up and wear my lipstick and sometimes I, I don't, and that's okay because it's a casual environment. Right. But think things like auditions that I've done recently, no, like I'm wearing a nice dress and heels to that audition because who knows who's going to be in that room? You know what I mean? So it's just kind of reading the audience. <laughs> that's right. It's a situational thing, correct? And I know some people, I know there's pushback on that. And some people are affronted by that. Um, but every single thing that you go and purchase in the store, if everything was in brown paper packaging, would you buy it the same? Like, like we're just, it's so inbred. Like it's so, it's so integral all the way through life. You know, are you attracted to a red book more than you're attracted to a black book? Or like, I'm just thinking behind me here, these books, which yeah. one do you see? You see this one, this one. You yes, know? right, exactly. It's old and red, right? So it, it's, yeah. It's, and it's not, it's, it's just an awareness and you have to figure out how you as your individual humanity fit into that. It's a really interesting topic in the way that it can differ so much for different types of people. And Hannah and I have yeah. talked about this in different ways um, because it's different for Hannah, but for me, when I'm thinking of what to wear to a performance and audition, anything like that, I'm thinking, who's gonna be there? What should I wear? What am I auditioning for? I don't, um, I don't feel comfortable wearing skirts or dresses personally. Okay. That's just me. And so I'm like, okay, so my options here, are I can wear a suit, which is my fave, or mm -hmm. there's like a more feminized jumpsuit. And I'm thinking, okay, so what am I auditioning for? This is a pretty feminine ro role and I'm a soprano. So okay. typically it's going to be more feminine things. And there'll be times where I'm, I'll wake up one day and I will hate the idea of wearing a feminine jumpsuit as opposed to wearing a suit. But I'm like, that's probably gonna get me further in this moment than wearing the suit. Yeah. Well, um, good. that's a really good thing to think about because I always have a couple of choices and then I choose the one that I know that I'm gonna feel great in. Yes, and exactly. No matter what I'm gonna wear. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and, and none of the choices are like, you know, shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Right? Yeah, no, no beachwear involved for obvious reasons. <laughs> so, 
Um, but but I do think, uh, rightly so, that that if you ha- you have to feel good. Yeah. You have to because f- you're the one performing, right? Yeah. Like I like these pearls I have on. I love them, right? Like I'm a pearl. Co- I love pearls. That's my thing. You but are. I can't wear these when I sing because they're too heavy on the sternum. So, you know, like just I wear something else. Just yeah, yeah. stuff like that. They bug my neck a bit at the back when I'm singing. So, so it's the same thing when you're wearing something for an audition or to a rehearsal or when I pack, I always pack a couple of choices. Yeah, that's true. Always. Yeah, I always bring like I wear one dress and then I'll bring another one because I'm like if I change my mind last minute, I have it. Oh, or somebody <laughs> spills tea on it or coffee, yeah. or, you know. This yeah. is true. Absolutely. So one of the one of the other things that we wanted to talk about, I have a particular interest in this, and I read this from your blog, which can be found on your website. Yeah. Um, for the people listening, you can uh, find that link down below. Um, and uh, one thing that was really fascinating to me was um, you do mo- uh, meditation and you went on a silent meditation retreat. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so ironic, I, really. <laughs> as a singer. As a singer, how was that? <laughs> a surprise because I signed up for it. My husband and I signed up, my partner and I, whatever, whatever, they, whatever the words are. We signed up for it. And um, um, I went in the door. We were a little bit late because we were traveling a far distance. And I went in the door and there was somebody sitting behind the desk. And I went, oh, hi, I'm so sorry we're late. I know like dinner started 30 minutes ago, but like we're here now and the, and the snow is bad. But and she was like, shh. And you're like, whoa. I went, Nothing okay? She goes, this is a silent retreat. And I went, oh, yeah. really? <laughs> Did you not know it was silent? Nope. Oh no. It was a meditation retreat, but I didn't. It was a silent. Wow. Retreat. Okay. <laughs> I didn't read that word. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the good thing was that um, um, there were a lot of giggling. There was a lot of giggling because I don't know that everybody knew that it was silent. And I sat across from this wonderful woman at dinner, and she and I, without even knowing each other, looked at each other. It was the most astounding thing looked at each other and she knew and i knew that we were going to be fast friends oh and we just connected and we did end up talking a couple of times over the weekend when we were allowed to talk but um that weekend taught me a lot about the power of silent communication both with people in a room and with yourself right so so you know, this is a harried life. You were asking me earlier about how you balance all the things that we do, right? Mm -hmm. And I think each of us needs to find the thing that grounds us or the things that ground us. So mine's a revolving door of things um, and they include meditation on a regular basis. Um, So it's a it became what I didn't realize until the end when I was speaking with the um, the Tibetan monk who led this was that there were there there were fourteen levels of 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 fourteen levels of meditation, and I'm like, okay, so we're gonna get to fourteen by the end of the weekend, right? <laughs> no, maybe number two. Wow, as it takes even monks who do it all day every day who do it for their lives don't get to 14 sometimes before they leave this earth. So, uh, you know, goal set a girl is silent. I'm going to work hard while I'm quiet. Um, and um, no. So it, it was a lesson in humility. It was a lesson in silence. And it keeps me there on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Reminds me to go within because we're stronger inside than we think. It reminds me that silence in the chaos of this world is an important part of our lives right. and as musicians we live making noise a specific kind of noise but we make we live making noise and that when there's no noise that's when we get to hear who we really are mm-hmm. that's deep yeah i'm like okay point blank period we're done here <laughs> yeah and the cast <laughs> yeah. that's really beautiful our favorite question is, we always ask, what is your why? Why do you get out of bed 
and go teach and perform? Why do you do what you do every day? What's your why? Mm, what's my why? Mm. And it's allowed to change. Ch whys change all the time. Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. They do because some days it's just because I have to. Yeah. And, but generally my why is because I am a curious teacher. I'm a, I'm curious. I'm deeply curious about it because it kind of goes back to that archaeology thing, you know, um, archaeology is a, is a curious life because mm -hmm. you're just looking for the next thing to provide light on to something that you thought you had a basic knowledge of, but then you find another treasure and it changes the way that you look at something. And I think that, I think that well, whether we're discovering music, um, whether the way somebody sings it, or you're discovering a new score, or you're discovering a new piece of Schubert leader, or you're discovering a character for the first time, or you have the privilege of walking beside somebody as they discover their voice, that is the biggest teacher of all. It teaches, it teaches me how to be a better human being and it teaches me how to give back and it teaches me that I need to remain curious. There's a wealth of knowledge out there and I think that I'm just hungry. Yeah. Right? When you find one thing, then you look for the next thing and you look for the next thing. It's like Pac-Man on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> you just are always wanting to find out. Uh, um, like it's curiosity. It's, it really is like, how come that works that way? It's almost childlike. It, why does Hannah do that when she sings that way? Um, I'm just using it as an example. I know. <laughs> so, and I have to sit and go. Yeah. And then, okay, that's how it works for her. Oh, that's cool. So then right. we figure okay. it out. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a why. Can I give you more than one why? Of course. Um, because I have a daughter. Yeah. Because I have a young woman that I'm launching and she's astounding. So that's a good why. Yeah. That's a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. I do have a nice partner too. That's okay. <laughs> They're pretty great. <laughs> You'll keep them around. I, I think the biggest why is, is because I, we need to create. And when we create, we can change the world. And I truly believe that in my heart of hearts, even one little Pac-Man bite at a time. That this podcast that we're doing, somebody's going to listen and they're going to go, oh, ding. Yeah. And that's all that matters. One ding. Exactly. One like. Yeah, that's why. That's my hope. Hannah yep. and I have talked ex extensively about why it's my favorite question. I ask it all the time for everything in life. Yes. And, uh, and my why is because I have something to say and I think the world can benefit from the things that people have to say about how it currently runs. So it's very interesting to see the change that can happen based on just people talking about it. Yeah. Simi, can I respond to that? Please. Um, I think I, I agree with you, but I would take it further than what people have to say. I would put it into that there's room for everybody and what they have to sing mm -hmm. and what they have to create. And yeah. as you're going out there and you're putting your art out there and people are saying, mm -mm, mm -mm. well, then they aren't your people. Yeah. It's not that it's not that you can't do what you're doing. It's just, oh, you need to find your people. Just go somewhere else. You'll find mm -hmm. your people, you know? Absolutely. I found mine. Yay. You're nice. I like you. I'll keep you around. <laughs> um, Awesome. Leslie, if you have some extra time, we would love to do a quick little rapid fire round with you, if that's all right. Sure. Yeah, I've got you scheduled till three. Right. Oh, perfect. <laughs> we'll have a long combo. <laughs> Next one's three. <laughs> now with a different Oh my method. gosh, there's cups. Okay. We have our questions in there. Okay, cool. Hannah, did you want to start us off? Of course I do. All right, let's do it. I have no idea what's in this cup. Usually we, like we pick our, our few and put them in and I've just been accumulating this cup so who knows what's going to come out okay here. okay good okay 
Leslie, describe yourself in three words. <laughs> yeah. This is the hardest one in my opinion. Yeah. Mother soprano lover. Okay. That's a great combo. I love that. Um, what is the favorite role you have ever played? This can be oratorio or opera. Oh. Um, I think I love to play um, a paid companion. So whenever I get to play like like somebody who's a prostitute or something like that, because um, it's not my world, and I I think there's well, the sadness and not great things with that sometimes, there's also a different kind of freedom. So, mm -hmm. and it's not who I am, so it's farthest away. So it's always a role that is not where I live. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. In my imagination, right? Like I get to use my imagination way more. <laughs> okay. Um, what advice would you give your younger self? Don't get married so often. <laughs> Yeah, my dad would probably do the same one. <laughs> I love that. That's so funny. It's like um, Ross from Friends, how he like gets divorced three times or something like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, Just that's say. a good one. Yeah. Um, going off of that uh, that lead, what's the best advice you were ever given? The best advice I was ever given. Yeah just sing the damn song damn straight there it is i literally have that written on so many scores right so that's for my <laughs> mom and dad right that's for my mom and dad when i was earlier on in my career when i was traveling around a lot and i was in europe and 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 singing in france um and the plane was late and you know family life was crap and like there was just bad stuff happening I got this phone call. Why are you there? Well, I'm singing this blah, blah, blah. What are you doing there? You're singing? Put the rest of it aside. Put your thinking cap on. Put your blinders on. Just sing the damn song. The rest mm -hmm. of it doesn't matter. And so that's sort of been a family saying for my entire singing life. And I've shared that now with many students. Um, if my parents ever wrote a biographical book, it would probably that would be the title. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's can be funny, it appeared when I was singing it. Um, uh, when I was singing at the Royal Albert Hall, a bunch of balloons were backstage, <laughs> some flowers on the bottom and a card that said just sing the damn song, not signed. And then and then when I was in Bordeaux, I go back into my hotel room and there's this massive bouquet of flowers. Like only the French can do stunning flowers. Yeah. And there was a card that wasn't signed. It said, just sing the damn sang. It didn't make it in the translation. So I have these cards from different times in my life where it says, just sing the damn sang or something. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. I love that. Oh, Leslie, who's your opera singer oratorio crush? Oh, only one? I'll give you three. How about three? Top three. Is that harder, choosing three people? Um, you know, this is really hard because they're different for different things. So, I mean, for for a person who who is, who I think is glued to the score and doesn't care if they sound ugly. It doesn't care about being pristine and perfect. It would have to be callous. We'd yeah. have to be Maria callous. Mm -hmm. um, but for a person who is glued to the score and it is beautiful, it would have to be my teacher, Ileana Kotrabas. Um, then I get one more. Sure. Who makes my knees melt? Um, let me think. Mm, that's hard. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I'm trying to. I can't. Um, I like Bryn Turfel a lot. That's I like our second Bryn. one. That was what someone said. Yeah, Shannon Coates said uh, Bryn as well. Mm -hmm. I do like Bryn. Um, I do. Uh, yeah, I do like Bryn mm -hmm. because he's uh, he's not afraid to take chances, and I think that that's that's why I choose them because all three of those people are not afraid to take emotional chances on stage. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, what is a guilty pleasure or bad habit you will never break? <laughs> Red wine. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> and maybe great gin. Oh, gin. Yeah. Like, like in the summertime, more gin and tonic. Yep. But spectacular red wine, never. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I don't know if that's a bad habit or not, but I could have said something like ridiculous. <laughs> There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, uh, who's your favorite composer to sing? Oh, oh, that's changed over my life. Yeah. Um, I would definitely say Verdi right now, but earlier on, I, I, but he never gets, Handel never gets old. I sort of get, went back to that earlier. So yeah, but Verdi now, there's just so much more, anything bel canto, there's just so much more room for me to pour the, depth of my existence into agreed yeah <laughs> um what is your favorite oh garment. Garment. favorite garment you ever sewed <laughs> oh oh the favorite garment i ever sewed hmm you mean on stage right yeah sure yeah yeah okay um i think it would have to be, there's a gown that is on the cover of my first CD and I bought the material and the uh, beading ribbon in Bordeaux and uh, it's very, it's beautiful. That. That note was, yeah, perfect timing there. Okay, what's the most recent thing you have learned? My last one. Most recent thing I have learned? Like, you mean like the whole big picture of things? It could be specific or random, whatever. That I have an obsession with buying jewelry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I couldn't have guessed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, something musical maybe. Um, I'm, I'm working on, um, I'm working on a recital right now for uh, here, at, here at Laurie next month with Anna Ranai and we're doing some Viado songs. And, oh, uh, the Viado songs that are to Chopin mazurkas and like the words, Viado put the words to the Chopin mazurkas and I didn't know them before now. And uh, what I really didn't know was that Chopin played for Viado when she sang them. That's so cool. Yeah. That's so awesome. that's cool. That's what I'm learning right now. Uh, the last question is, if you could uh, speak to any uh, any composer, which composer would you like to speak to? Oh. Well, I think that I have to say Viado right now. Okay. Yeah. Because she was so avant-garde in her time, right? And, and there are, there's an amazing picture of her sitting behind her organ in the front, in a room with pictures around her and an audience in front. She used to have these salon evenings. She was brilliant. She was a chameleon. She was, yes, I think Pauline Viando. Um, because I can read letters from the other, all a lot of the male composers, right? And I'm sure that Viando has letters. I just haven't discovered that yet. So you know, if you read Mozart's letters, you get to know about Mozart. You read Beethoven's letters, you get to know Beethoven. So I, I haven't done that yet. So I might put that on my reading list. Very cool. Yeah. Well, Leslie, thank you so much for doing this. Can you, uh, can you tell the people where they can find out more about you? You can find out more about me on www.lesliefagan.com or through Wilfrid Laurier University at the Faculty of Music and the voice area. There's a whole little blob thing there on me. 
um, most of my music is available on Apple Music and Spotify. Uh, some of it's on YouTube, I've just discovered. So there you go. Thank you so <laughs> much, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Pleasure. So I'm a vegan who eats meat. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't do eggs, honey, or dairy, but you'll do the animals. No, no, no. I do eggs, honey, and dairy. <laughs>